First of all, let me introduce to you, if you are not uh, familiar with him already, my good friend, Doug Casey. Good evening, Doug. Hi, Harry. Thank you so much. For that eloquent introduction. <laughs> um, and um, uh, what I'd like is if, uh, I, I know this may not be what you had in mind, and it may not be what the people had in mind who tuned in thinking that Doug Casey was going to be on tonight and they were going to get some free investment advice. But what I would like to know, first of all, is what was the theme of your speech? How would you sum up what you told the audience? <laughs> well, I was really playing off of the, uh, the keynote speaker of that conference that year. They always have uh, some big muffy mark from Washington there to <laughs> draw in the Republicans uh, to the conference. But it's an expensive conference. People have to pay six or seven hundred dollars, so you have to have you know some well-known name that's going to give them the inside. And this year, it happened to be uh, uh, George Tenet, uh, who was the uh, director of the CIA. Was he still then? Uh, no, he just he just uh, left the employ of government in order to uh, reap his uh, well-earned rewards, which is to say, corporate directorships and fifty thousand dollars speaking fees and multi-million dollar book contracts. And Doug was just beginning to tell us about the New Orleans Gold Conference last November, at which he attended, and that the featured political mucky muck uh, of the conference was uh, George Tennant, who was just leaving the uh, uh, CIA at the time, of which he had been director, and uh, that uh, he had already, I guess, begun receiving his uh, blessings and his uh, 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 corporate uh, rewards for uh, having uh, done so much for the administration and uh, was now uh, working on corporate boards and uh, getting uh, large speaking fees around the country and so forth. As those, of, uh, those of us with real intelligence had to sit by and be settle, settling for five or ten thousand dollars. That's the nice thing about <clears throat> about this country is that we don't. It's very rare and considered scandalous to bribe public officials while they're still in office. But what we do is we. There's a certain the nice thing about America, America is there's still an element of trust in this country where the with guys that are in government, they, they, they trust that the people that they've done wonderful things for by using their political power are going to pay them off after they leave. And so, uh, you know, Tenet is uh, you know, collecting $50,000 speaking fees and looking at his corporate directorships and uh, uh, the stock options and all this type of thing. So, and, and it's all perfectly legit. I mean, sure. there's no money is crossed hands while, while he's in office. Right. So what was the uh, theme of his speech? Oh, it was basically, uh, he's a very uh, slick practice. Uh, Politician, and of course, uh, anybody that's high up in government, even if they're not elected uh, in actual the actual political process, they're all very slick uh, political infighters. And this guy, this guy was really good. He had this audience, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I predicted to to the audience beforehand. I told these. Oh, people, you spoke in advance of him. Yes, I think I did speak in advance of him this time. It doesn't matter to me whether I speak before or after. <laughs> I people, know, actually. But uh, I told the audience because this was perfectly predictable to me that. Uh, that the, like the whip dogs that they were, they, they'd roll over on their backs and wet themselves and in, in the light that a high government official was, was going to give them the insight, uh, insight, insight, insight of his, uh, 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 of his uh, public service in Washington. Well, I, I wasn't he about public that. service with a straight face. <laughs> That's right. So they, they love that word. They love that word. And the audience just eats it up, too. So, but the, the audience didn't eat my word. Uh, traditionally, when I give a speech, uh, uh, they're... The audience falls into two groups, the ones that either really, really like it or the ones that really want to spring me up. And uh, this audience became very vocal, where uh, uh, there were people that were catcalling. From, you know, the, Actually catcalling? Yes, of course, because uh, apparently I don't realize that we're, we're, we're fighting a war right now, and we all have to pull together behind our government officials. And if we're not fighting in Iraq, we're going to have to fight in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Well, or if not Iraq, uh, maybe Thailand or uh, Sudan or, or, or Brazil. We've got to fight someplace, after all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How are you to keep the empire going unless you should you go off the fight? So um, yeah, that's 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 what it was. Uh, that's that's what it was about, and it was, it was the most shocking thing. And to me, this was shocking. Was that uh, later after my speech, uh, uh, a friend of mine was just mingling in the crowd afterwards, uh, with just just being there, and he overheard a, heard a conversation between a couple of uh, middle-aged white guys. And the one guy says, the other guy says, yeah. We ought to turn that guy Casey into Homeland Security and have people saying things like this. And, uh, this, this is very funny, of course, but uh, it's actually very scary. It gives you an idea of the actual psychological center of this country right now. And that, uh, even, even after uh, two, three year, two years in uh, Iraq, still uh, somebody uh, making a statement like that. Yes, it's, uh, it's absolutely, absolutely shocking. So one of the things that I said, of course, that uh, must have antagonized the audience, I have many, many things I said, I... I, I didn't see praise upon the U.S. military, for one thing, and we can go into that if you'd like. That'll, sure. that'll, that'll certainly uh, tee off lots of your uh, listeners, I'm sure, Harry. Not necessarily, but we'll see. But, uh, yeah, that's right. We can always experiment and find out. Yes. But, um, oh, God, what was, I, what was I going to say before? Oh, you have something that teed, you, uh, that teed off a lot of uh, listeners there, or viewers uh, <laughs> audience there. Yes, I'm trying to think. Of there. there are a number of things that are popping through my mind right now, but the, but the uh, oh, yeah, I think what it was, of course. It's, I drew to their attention, because this audience in New Orleans is, uh, 
is a, a rather wealthy, uh, middle-aged, uh, white Republican audience. Uh, they're, they're all conservatives. Kind of. And I pointed out to them that the average American, uh, Bubis Americanus, as H.L. Mencken would have, would have turned them, and, and so these people are not friends of yours. And how do I know they're not friends of yours? Because the fact is that right now, about 50% of the American public is getting more from government than they give to government. Most Americans actually don't even pay income taxes. They pay very insubstantial income taxes, but they, most, of the, most of the tax burden that they, uh, that's taken out of their paychecks is uh, in the form of a FICA or Social Security. So most of these people uh, get more from the government directly and indirectly than they give to the government. And so they're, you know, they're sapping off of the rich people in this country. And, of course, uh, uh, it's creating a, uh, uh, an atmosphere of class warfare in this country, but the average American is not your friend just because somebody's uh, some government has issued the same passport to somebody else. doesn't mean that you have to have any values in common with them. I mean, sure. if, if I look around the average American and see what they think and say and do, I realize that I have friends in the Congo that are better people and that I have more respect for and more loyalty to than I do to these fellow Americans out here who yeah. are an active threat to me. In fact, the average American is a bigger threat to me and to you and to most of the people listening right now uh, than any Iraqi, or any thousand, or ten thousand, or twenty million Iraqis. Yeah. Right. Because, the average, because the average Iraqi never did anything to you. The average American wants to steal your property and regulate you and applaud when the guys in the government do it. Well, and Doug speaks from experience because he has met a lot of average uh, Congo. He uh, has traveled the world and, and been to countries that I would never want to see the light of day in, and uh, has had quite a bit of experience with that. But when we come back, I'm going to disagree with you uh, a bit on, on that, Doug. Uh, part of it is a matter of semantics, and part of it is a matter, I think, of just plain misunderstanding among people of what they're doing and what they're getting. Anyway, I'm going to take issue with you a little on the, uh, uh, on the question of uh, whether these people are your friends. Uh, I agree very basically with the principle that you're stating, uh, that a lot of these people sitting next to you in the audience who, Joe, I want you to meet Joe Jones here, who's a very successful contractor, and listened near me in uh, uh, Park uh, City, uh, Utah, or whatever. And, of course, Joe Jones made his living by government contracts or whatever it is. And he's not what I would consider a successful businessman. I would consider him a successful political animal. And there are a lot of those people around. But there also are a lot of hardworking people who uh, have made their living by giving people what they want, by building the kind of houses that people want, and by working very hard building uh, office buildings and so on. And in the process, for all they know, they are getting some kind of government insurance on something or other. And they're getting this and they're getting that. And you have to put them down on the side of the ledger of people who uh, are getting money from the government. And uh, as well as getting money to the government, and who knows which side is, is the heavier, the assets or the liabilities or the income or the outgo. And um, I don't think they asked for it. I don't think they lobbied for it. I don't think they want it. It just happens to be there, like Social Security or other things. So tell me how I get out of Social Security. And if I join young enough and live long enough, I'm going to get more for Social Security than I put into it, which is not to say I asked for it or lobbied for it or wanted it. And uh, all of this uh, stands aside. The polls that have been taken in the last 10 to 15 years, which I harp on on this show a lot, which you, you might not be aware of, and that is that in all of the polls taken by ABC, by Gallup, by all the big polling companies in America over the last 10 or 15 years, all show that the majority of Americans believe that government is not just too big, but way too big, and that the politics of that government doesn't really accomplish anything that it sets out to do, and that people want smaller government, and so on. And these are legitimate polls. These aren't ones that were commissioned by somebody in order to get a, a predetermined result. And uh, I believe those polls. And when people say, you know, well, why do they keep electing these same guys over and over again? Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to vote for the Prohibitionist Party, knowing that's going to get 38 votes in the next election, uh, that it's outlawed in the state of uh, Maryland, you know, and so on and so forth? Uh, and I'm making these figures up, please understand. And I'm making, making up the figures of <laughs> the votes that gets in the, uh, and the being outlawed in Maryland, but not making up. Yeah, Harry, I agree with you in, in your defense of the average American that you're making, uh, if only because I believe that uh, in something called Pareto's Law, uh, that's the law. There are many applications of it. What do you call it again? Uh, Pareto's Law. Oh, Plato, Plato's Law, yeah. yeah it, it, it's, there are many, many applications of it, but the um, best known one is that you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and 20% of the people will make 80% of the trouble, and so forth. And, and this, sure. basically, Pareto's Law is that you, you take, divide 80, 20, and then you can take that 20, and you can divide it into 80% or 20%, and so forth, and so on. And so my, my view on it, using Pareto's Law, is that 80%, of all the people out there are basically decent, hard-working, mind-your-own-business human beings. I have no problem with them at all. And that would mean 80% of Americans are that way. So why do I say, in view of that, saying that 80% of Americans are, uh, are basically decent human beings, uh, why do I say that most Americans are not your friend? And that's, that's because the system in this country is so corrupted, people, that, um, that even people that are basically decent have become corrupted by the... Uh, by the uh, political system. Sure, and when somebody comes along and says, would you like to have a, a student loan for your, so your child can get into Harvard instead of uh, Hawaii, uh, uh, obviously the, the person is going to say yes, or most obviously, obviously they're going to say yes. 
which uh, corresponds, I think, exactly to what you're saying. And, uh, uh, but I, th- I think really that if presented with the uh, A or B opportunity in the right way, people are going to choose our way. But we're a long way from being able to present it in the right way. And uh, this is not a plug uh, for a political party to say, let's all join the Libertarian Party, it'll be all right. But it is a plug for, number one, keeping hope alive. Because there are a lot of things that could create that situation where the A, equal, a, a, t- a versus B choice is actually presented to the American people. And I, I've mentioned some from time to time. One is that suddenly some billionaire gets active in, and uh, eager to do something about this and actually sees things in a principled way. And, uh, and another is that just people like you and me and the people listening to this podcast keep talking about these things. And the next thing you know, uh, you've got uh, several million people, still not as many as registered Republicans or registered Democrats, but several million people who are talking out and meaning something. And included in those are a few hundred billion, a hundred million dollar uh, people. And uh, there are all kinds of possibilities. And we'll continue to explore this just as soon as we get back from this break. And uh, we've gotten a little away from uh, the New Orleans conference of last year and the turmoil you created there. Uh, what, what interests me about that, if we can just return to it for a minute, is um, do you think you'll be invited back this year? Well, you know, I... Uh, or have you already, yeah. Well, interestingly, yes, I was. Because, you know, some time ago, and I even realized this in the investment business that we're both in for many years, is that uh, more than anything else, it's about entertainment. Uh, people people want to be entertained, and whether they, they gain anything from uh, uh, the ideas that you might put across or something, well, that's catch as catch can. But, but they're really looking for uh, that's why people like WWF wrestling and so forth. They they, they really want entertainment. That's why actually this is a this is a thought that I've that I've, uh, that I've had. And tell me if you agree with me. Uh, everybody knows that we started the mankind started out as a, a hunter gatherers, and then we moved into an agricultural society, and then we became an industrial society. And uh, then uh, some years ago, people started saying, you know, we, we live in an information society. And I'd say, no, that's actually old hat now. We actually, at the present time, live in an entertainment society because the best, the best paid people in the world now are, are, are singers and uh, actors uh, and people like that that, uh, that entertain you. So anyway, that's uh, getting back to what we were talking about with, with New Orleans. I'm pretty sure I'd, I'd go back just to, just to entertain the people. And the promoter of the conference uh, rose to the occasion. And he set up a debate, uh, which is one of the reasons, of course, that I'm unhappy that New Orleans is inundated for really personal reasons. Is there was going to be a de- debate between me and uh, Susan Estrich, who's a kind of a, uh, a leftist. Yeah, she's a, she's a Democratic activist. Uh, she, she actually was the uh, uh, campaign manager of either, for a while, of either Gore or uh, Kerry. I believe it was uh, Gore during the primary season and maybe for part of the general election season. So she's a, a big-time player. Oh, that would have been good. It was going to be her and, and the uh, mad dog of the right, uh, Ann Coulter. Yeah, well, that's, that's the only... Uh, who is the, the head of the conference now who runs it? Uh, Brian London. Okay, well, he has a, a big libertarian background because he worked for Jim Blanchard for many years. Right. And, and so if it hadn't been that Brian uh, London was the uh, promoter of the conference, someone like you would have never been there. It would have just been Coulter and uh, Estridge. And it would have been the same old shouting match that goes on on CNBC and, and Fox and uh, CNN and so forth. Exactly, but nobody ever talks about uh, such a thing as a principle. Nobody knows that a principle even existed. Right. So that, yeah, you're right. That would have been a tremendous debate. Uh, I can just picture uh, Estridge saying, well, the Republicans don't do this and so forth and so on. And Coulter saying, of course the Republicans do they've been doing this, you know, so forth and so on, and besides, all you want is a political payoff from your friends, and, you know, just back and forth, Republicans versus Democrats, and then suddenly in walks Doug Casey to the particular line of conversation and says, well, why don't we look at it this way? Yeah, so which, is, which, which is to say that there are really just two wings of one party, the Demo-Republican Party, and there's not enough difference between them to, to make them worth blowing to hell, either one of them. The main differences between them are that the Republicans say that they believe in free markets, but they definitely don't believe in uh, social freedom. And, of course, they don't believe in free markets either. No. And, and, and the Democrats, they, they believe in social freedom, but they definitely don't believe in free markets. And that's a lie as well. Yes. So, you know, it's just a gigantic spindle. And it, it amazes me that uh, the average American can get into an audience uh, and listen to, these, listen to these morons talking, and the average American gets us worked up, uh, starts hooting and panting like a chimpanzee, uh, listening to these <laughs> politicians. Which I'm just embarrassed. Back to the wrestling matches again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and now here's the rock. Yay! <laughs> And, but, and the wrestling matches are really so much more fun. I actually oh, God, enjoy yeah. them. The acting is a heck of a lot better. Yes. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they don't hurt anybody. They don't even hurt each other. Right. And all the politicians do no, it. No, wait a second. There they are alike. They both pretend to hurt the other side. Right. <laughs> and they never hurt anybody. <laughs> and, and, and to my knowledge, there are no criminals among the wrestlers. They're, right. they're just honest entertainers. Uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're you're right. Well, you're uh, also right that it would have been great if uh, that uh, debate had taken place. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, of course, we got a lot more to be upset about with uh, what happened with Katrina. And we're going to talk about that in the second hour of this show because, uh, uh, as uh, Carlo Hallow put it, the whole thing has been a failure. Uh, 
has not been a problem of the weather, it's been a problem of the government uh, that has just created irreparable uh, harm among the people of, of Louisiana, Mississippi, and so on. And it's not the government, it's not the, the, the weatherman's fault, it's not, uh, the na- it's not nature's fault, it's the fault of the government, and we will show you how in the second hour. I have been remiss in not mentioning that Doug has a monthly newsletter, and uh, as you know, probably from listening to me, if you've been listening to me over the past few years, uh, I'm not much for speculating anymore at this stage of my life, and all I care about is setting up a portfolio that I know will take care of me in whatever age will come, in whatever circumstances will come. And uh, Doug, uh, however, has a publication, the name of which Doug is? International Speculator. A Speculator. Now, that doesn't seem to jive exactly with investing, so I don't read too much of Doug's in, uh, speculating in advice at uh, this stage of my life, and uh, even I would say for anybody that they should set up a sound investment portfolio first, and then, if you want... Uh, to do some speculating with money you can ill afford to lose, but uh, pardon me, it's money you can afford to lose. Uh, how am I doing so far, Doug? No, 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 <laughs> pretty good, Harry, but I, I, I agree with you because, you know, uh, my little subspecialty in, in, in the market has always been finding exploration stocks, and they're the most volatile securities on the face of the planet, or volatile even than the Internet stocks were. And what kind of stocks are you talking about? Mining, ex- mining exploration okay, stocks. Okay, gotcha. And, and for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing to get involved in these things, it's just like handing a, a six-year-old a chainsaw. <laughs> just don't, don't recommend it. Okay. But, uh, no, but it's uh, but that's what I that's what I do, and I, I try to keep uh, keep folks amused with a uh, happy patter. And uh, right. Well, let, let me get, let me get to the climax. The, the, before that, let me just say that even if you feel like a six-year-old with a chainsaw, if you just simply make sure that you can't lose more than any amount that you are actually putting up. And that uh, you have a, a way of getting out so that you don't lose any more money than you can possibly lose, or to, than you can afford to lose. Uh, uh, then you might want to take a play with uh, some of Doug's stocks. But suppose you don't even want to do that, that uh, uh, you don't even want to speculate. Then still, I highly recommend this newsletter because there's always a section in the newsletter where he talks about what's going on in the world. And we got uh, split the sidetrack, and so we never got that number. What do you have? Oh, well, uh, you I don't have an 800 number. Oh. I, I do have a... How about a 200 number? <laughs> Until we get up and running. I, I've got a website, but almost everybody has one of those these days. Sure. And uh, it's very simple. Just go to www.dougcasey.com. Doug Casey, how would I remember that? I have to think of some of the model. Well, you could think of International Speculator if you wanted to, and, uh, and dial that in as well. Okay. International Speculator or Doug Casey, which is D-O-U-G-C-A-S-E-Y. Yeah, and that's and, a little uh, work. And how long have you been publishing a letter one way or another? Oh, Harry, I'm shocked to tell you, but uh, at this point... Twenty-six years. Twenty-six years. Twenty-six years. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's longer than I published. I published, I published for, uh, what was it, 25 years or 23 years. Something yeah, like that. it's funny how time goes by, isn't it? And most disturbing, too. Yes, and uh, as everybody knows, faster the older you get. And as not so many people know, the reason is that each year, as you go older, each year represents a smaller percentage of your life. And that's, yes. that's why it seems to be a faster period of time. That's, that's right. I, I puzzled this out, actually, when I was in my 20s, when I was skydiving actively. <laughs> you trying to figure out what percentage of your life is digging you to the ground. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah, that's a good time to think about these things. Because <laughs> what happens is, when, when you jump out of a plane, uh, typically you go out at around, uh, typical delay period is about 30 seconds. And to get that, you jump out at around 7,500 feet. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, when you first fall out, uh, jump out of a plane, and, and the first 5 or 10 or 15 seconds, it feels like you could fall forever because mm. the ground is not approaching noticeably, like being in, in youth. And then, uh, you know, well, once you get to around, you know, 3,000 feet, oh, now it's coming up. And when you get to 2,000 feet, it's, it's the ground rush effect. And at that point, you, you better look to pull because you're, you're closing in on the ground at anywhere in between 120 and 200 miles an hour. But the thing is, I called it the ground rush effect. That, that as, as the skydive is coming to an end, um, of course, we don't have a parachute uh, that we can pull to slow things down. That's the only if the analogy falls down, perhaps. <laughs> okay, well, uh, the, the um, website address, again, and I hope we're not the last time, is DougCasey.com or InternationalSpeculator.com. Now, um, what I want to know is what you were saying about the war on terror in New Orleans last November, or what you're saying about it now, or what you're saying both times. Whatever. Well, it, 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 it's a massive criminal endeavor that uh, is, is absolutely unprecedented and shocking in its scope. Uh, regrettably, the United States, uh, has often, you know, bullied small countries. I mean, we've, for, you know, for decades, uh, especially since the, the time of the uh, Spanish-American War, always invaded these little nothing-nowhere countries in, in Central America and, and the Caribbean. But maybe that's not, because you know, it's not real countries. And, you know, who, who knows? You can make up excuses for that. But this is the first time that the U.S. has ever invaded another country completely without provocation of any type. Completely... Uh, without an excuse. No excuses whatsoever. It was, it was just a... Uh, it, it was just a... The pure criminal miscreancy, and uh, the, that's shocking. But it's even more shocking that uh, once this happened, Americans didn't turn out into the streets and uh, march on the White House, uh, all Bush out and uh, tar and feather him, and 
ride my Washington on a rail, which is what used to happen in this country to political types uh, when during a more graceful era. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and when I said without any excuse, what I meant was without any any uh, uh, stated excuse, rational or irrational, plausible or implausible, true or false or whatever. They didn't even try to make an excuse that America was threatened, although they came up with a few lame things. Oh, well, you know, the, the, the two ostensible reasons why uh, why this country invaded our erstwhile ally, which uh, was, of course, he used to be our client, was uh, number number one, it was alleged that he had weapons of mass destruction, which was a lie from the beginning to the end, and I mean, even I knew that. Uh, not having been to Iraq. I did go to Syria last year for, for a week, which I thought was interesting, because Syria, is, along with uh, Iran, is perhaps the next country on the invasion death chart. Sure. But, uh, so I, I did go there to check it out. And anybody that's even been to that part of the world would consider it absolutely, insanely laughable to think that these places, which are backward, quiet, uh, that, they, that they're in a position to invade anybody. They can't even feed themselves, for God's sake. So that was the one reason for invading Iraq. And what was the other, what was the other hokey reason that they gave for it? Uh, weapons of mass destruction, and oh yeah, oh. so that was a friend of Osama uh, bin Laden's or whatever. Oh yeah. Another, another absolutely pathological, transparent lie. Which, uh, which incidentally, to get back to the war on terror, was, was only a useful reason, if you can say useful, because it had already been established that Osama bin Laden was pure evil and uh, the war on terror was necessary. So that had to be established first, and then you could say, we'll see, Saddam Hussein's part of this war on terror, and so we have to do it. Yes, it's well known that all of our enemies, uh, in every time and place, are always pure evil, and we're always always the good guys. But then again, you know, most Americans are aware of the fact that the Germans during World War II all supported their government, and they thought that they were on the right side doing the right thing because Germany was threatened and they had no alternative but to, but to uh, attack the Poles and then the Russians and, uh, before they were attacked. And then they all supported us. And, uh, you know, it's, not, it's so scary. Uh, they say these unpatriotic things, but patriotism isn't a virtue, in my view. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a vice and a very, very scary one. It's much worse than any of the vices that William Bennett is partial to. <laughs> William Bennett being the former war on... Uh, on uh, war on drugs guy. Czar, yeah, and, and also... The, and, 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 and the compiler. I'm not going to say author. He didn't write it. He just compiled it of the uh, so-called Book of Virtues. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yes, and so you told these things to the people in uh, Louisiana. Yeah, and they, they, didn't, they didn't take very kindly to it, frankly. I mean, we have this, uh, we have this ethos in this country where my country right or wrong, which is... Well, first of all, that's wrong, but it's even worse than that because... We're not talking about supporting the country. We're talking about supporting the government. And those are two totally different things. Right. There's not even a relation between them. And people uh, conflate these things without logically thinking them out. But they're not supporting the country. They're supporting the government. Right. And uh, even more so supporting the people in government, the political the guys there, simply because they're of the party that I voted for last. No yes, yeah, it's even worse than that. And, and nobody even says this stuff in public. I, it makes me think that there's, there's really uh, no hope, Harry. I know that you're an optimist about these things, but, <laughs> but I, I just don't see that there's any way out at this point. Uh, even these big trends of history, I'm afraid we're on the, the downslope of one. Well, I'm going to give you uh, just a very simple reason for my optimism, and then we're going to switch to the subject I've been promising all night, and that is New Orleans. And I'll start out by responding to what Doug said about he's not as optimistic as I am. And uh, I am not optimistic, I am hopeful. And hopeful means that I can see how this thing could be solved. Optimistic would mean that I think it will be solved. I don't know that it will be solved. I just know that it's possible. And E.B. White, the children's writer who wrote uh, Charlotte's Web and uh, some other fairly famous uh, children's books like uh, Stuart Little and so on, uh, once said, as long as there is one honest man, as long as there is one upright woman, the future is not hopeless because the contagion may spread. That as long as there's, that's the end of the quote, but as long as there's one person speaking the truth, whether it's Doug Casey or Harry Brown or you who's listening to the show, it means somebody else may hear it and take up the, the uh, uh, story and repeat it to others and others repeat it to others and so forth. And of course, we're not starting with one person today. We're starting with millions of people who realize that government doesn't work, that government is a ridiculous answer to any question that comes up. And um, we need to, to realize that we're not alone, that uh, people are being hurt by government every day. And we need to realize that New Orleans and other events like that continually add to the, to the uh, evidence that government doesn't work. And uh, let me give you one example. Uh, this is a, <laughs> I love this. This is a national disgrace, said New Orleans Emergency Operations Chief Terry Ever. We can send massive amounts of aid to, to Sami victims, but we can't bail out the city of New Orleans. Well, why don't we turn that around for a moment and just say, we can't bail out the city of New Orleans. So what makes us think we can send massive amounts <laughs>
not see that much throughout the United States, but the BBS, uh, which is shown on PBS television. Every day. The BBC, man. Uh, BBC, yes, I'm sorry, BBC, yes, it must be some uh, football league. Uh, the BBC, which is uh, the BBC today is shown every night on PBS. Uh, I haven't been watching the, the television coverage of this, but I was just clicking around after the end of the tennis match on television night from my hospital bed, and I happened to see uh, this report on New Orleans. And um, I'm not sure where this was exactly, but the, the television, the video that they showed, was of one of these refugee camps that had been set up in New Orleans or Biloxi or someplace. And this was an area where people were fenced in. And in the middle of the, this huge, huge fenced-in yard was another yard, uh, was another fence, which was small enough that somebody the size of Doug Casey or I uh, or many other people could climb over that fence. And on the other side, on this side of the fence, were all these people, poor and rich, uh, old and young, uh, young and old and, <laughs> and old. I think I covered that. Pregnant women and uh, the injured and uh, the healthy and so forth. All of these on one side of this fence, and on the other side of the fence lands a helicopter. And the helicopter just throws out food from the helicopter, food in, in big, huge bundles, and I suppose other equipment like uh, medicines and so on. There was nobody on the other side, no authorities, no troops, no anyone. The, the helicopter just landed there and dumped all this stuff out. And, of course, the healthiest of all the people in the area there jumped over that fence, uh, sprung over the fence, and grabbed the food and made off with it or started selling it to people on the poor side of the fence and so on. And this is how the distribution works. Well, geez, we can't, you know, only government can do something like this. You can't trust the private sector. Only government can grab this food and exploit it and, and so on. And, and it was just so, such a moving image. It lasted about 15, 20 seconds. You saw this. And, there, and here on this side of the fence, you saw women crying. They had been waiting and waiting for days to get some food, uh, waiting desperately for aid of some kind or other. And the aid arrives and it's stolen from them. And uh, that's our government at work. And there were all sorts of images that came to mind. And Doug, I hope you'll excuse me because I'm going to use up this segment uh, talking about this. And then I want to open the mic to you and then open the mic to any callers who have questions about it. But I really am uh, head up about this. Uh, here's another little factoid for you. Um, why didn't the National Guard get there sooner? Well, because there are 7,000 National Guardsmen from Louisiana and Mississippi who are, guess where? Iraq? Yes, of course. I know you've got to them, too. Sure. Yes, 7,000 uh, National Guardsmen in Iraq who could not be there to help. And what does the National Guard do that's so wonderful? They help in times of emergency. That is, if they're not operating some ridiculous war on the other side of the world. They're creating an emergency someplace else. Yeah, yeah, right. And it goes on and on and on. Now, there has been uh, some wonderful stuff written about this. And I usually, every Saturday night, uh, put on my Radio Links page links to all the websites that uh, uh, I mentioned on the show, the websites where there are articles or uh, other information published that are, is referred to on the show. And I can't do it tonight because I'm sitting in a hospital bed. But I'm going to put these links up on Monday or Tuesday. I can't do it tonight, obviously. Uh, and there is wonderful stuff. And uh, as I said before, Newsweek has published articles on this, a number of articles on this, and there are a number of others. And Jim Babka has been nice enough to keep me informed of a lot of this information that's available uh, from the... Uh, uh, the Sun-Times uh, of uh, San Antonio published a lot of information that lets you know a lot of things that are a little bit different from all this wonderful stuff. God, the people in San Antonio opened their hearts. Well, they did, but you can only open your, uh, open your hearts if uh, the government isn't getting in the way. And uh, uh, there's all kinds of information that's from very, very mainline authorities uh, in the media and so on. And it's really wonderful to see all this. Now, uh, I can give you a shortcut to this so that you don't have to wait till you get all the links from me. LouRockwell.com, today and tomorrow, their weekend edition. It's just out of sight. It's one of the best libertarian sites on the Internet. And today's was devoted about two-thirds to uh, the whole uh, hurricane thing. And um, one of the terrific articles on there is Impeach Bush Now by Paul Greg Roberts. And I've got uh, a couple of uh, callers already on the line, including uh, the esteemed Alex uh, Jones, uh, one of our talk show hosts here on uh, the Genesis Network, whom I want to get to in a hurry. Plus, I've got one of the greatest guests in the world in Doug Casey. And so I'm going to quickly tell you that the premier article, the showcase article that you just absolutely have to read, is on the Internet at LouRockwell.com, but it was published yesterday. And if you just look at the homepage on the left-hand margin, you'll see the last seven days. And you just click on Friday. That's yesterday. And uh, it'll still be yesterday tomorrow. <laughs> and click on Friday. And then click on Lou Rockwell's article, which is at the top. And it's one of those goodies that Lou comes up with every once in a while. He's a great writer on his best day. And, uh, pardon me, on his normal day. And on his very best day, he is, just hits him out of the park. Um, but just to wrap up what all of these say, uh, tying it in with the war on terror, and then going into all the bad examples of the things that are happening there, Paul Craig Roberts in Impeach Bush now says, Bush's single-minded focus on the war on terrorism has compounded a national disaster and turned it into the greatest single calamity in American history. If terrorists had achieved this result, it would rank as the greatest terrorist success in history. The U.S. has lost its largest and most strategic port, thousands of lives, and 80% of one of America's most historic cities is underwater. Prior to 9-11, the Federal Emergency Management 
management agency going to New Orleans with a disaster waiting to happen. Congress authorized the money to protect the strategic port of refineries and the large population. However, after 2003, the flow of funds was diverted to the war in Iraq. During 2004 and 2005, the New Orleans Times Picayune even published nine articles citing New Orleans' loss of hurricane protection to the war in Iraq. Every Iraq, pardon me, every expert in newspapers as distant as Texas saw the New Orleans catastrophe coming. Uh, that's hospital talk. But President Bush and his insane government preferred war in Iraq to protecting Americans at home. Bush's war left the Corps of Engineers only 20% of the funding to protect New Orleans from flooding from Lake Pontchartrain. On June 18, 2004, the Corps manager uh, told the Times Picayune, "The levees are sinking. If we don't get the money to raise them, we can't stay out of the settlement." And on and on it goes. So, not content with leaving New Orleans unprotected, it took the Bush administration five days to get the remnants of the National Guard not serving in Iraq, along with desperately needed food and water, to devastate New Orleans. This is the slowest emergency response for the U.S. government in modern times, and it just goes on and on and on. Not just in how the government has laid the, the groundwork for all of this, and then secondly, how the government has just uh, responded horribly once the situation developed. And that's what we have. Doug, do you want to make uh, a short comment before we let's start listening to what our listeners have to say? Yeah, I, I do, Harry. Don't get away with the Scott Free, of course, because it's always somebody else's fault, and uh, Bush will put that idiotic, sincere grin on his face and help people roll over and believe him. So, well, know, and, and, and uh, right along with that, nobody will stand personally accounted, uh, accountable for what he has done. For whatever mistake, from Bush on down, nobody is going to pay any money for it. Nobody is going to go to jail for it. Uh, nobody is going to be uh, uh, ridden out of town on a rail, as I think you mentioned earlier before. I'd say, I'd say impeachment is far too light a penalty for, uh, for Bush. Oh, it's, 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 it's far murder. too light a penalty and for all the wrong reasons for Clinton. Well, that's water. Under yeah, no, you're right. It, it's uh, definitely murder in this case. Well, I'd like to uh, call in Alex Jones now, who's on the phone from Austin, Texas. Good evening, Alex. Hey, Harry. First of all, I just want to say that uh, we want you to get better because we need you. Oh, thank you, Doc. That's, that's very generous of you. You bet. Well, I also need somebody to be able to fill in on my radio show occasionally. And I, uh... <laughs> that's right. They called me to do this. I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to be in the hospital. And you can see how bad I am in the hospital. <laughs> Well, well, just God bless you. But uh, uh, Harry, the reason I called in is I walked out of the studio. I was working on a new documentary, and I was listening to you driving home. And, you know, back on Tuesday, we got some heat uh, at PrisonPlanet.com and InfoWars.com for just going back to the FEMA reports of 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, saying that short of a nuclear disaster or a giant, you know, you know 9.5 in San Francisco, the number one looming disaster was going to be New Orleans, and, and, and Bush did slash the funding. The Times pick and you, and I was aware of seven articles. I, I, I guess uh, you guys have dug up a few more. But the reason I called in is that three days ago... It, Every couple of days, uh, we will take an AP photo of Bush and put a joke bubble by his face like he's thinking of it. And, 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 and it was Bush looking out the window of Air Force One as he flew over uh, on Wednesday. And so we had the thought bubble saying, gee, I wonder if I can get away with giving Halliburton no-bid contracts on the disaster. Well, <laughs> you know, well the Houston Chronicle today came out, and it's on PrisonPlanet.com right now. The Houston Chronicle came out today, and guess who's getting no-bid emergency pay <laughs> oh, contracts? Oh, my God. <laughs> so there's so there's no uh, Halliburton is. There is no level to the end of arrogance or insanity or out-of-control behavior, and we have them caught red-handed, specifically slashing funding when they knew that city was below sea level. And, and even uh, I have the Houston Chronicle last year saying a direct uh, Category 5 hurricane on New Orleans would kill 500,000 people. Now, 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 again, that was the Houston Chronicle, the FEMA report last year. They were, uh, were reporting on that, so thank God it wasn't a direct hit. So they knew, and now he's going to pose as our savior to, oh, we've got to worship George Bush, this big government, un-American pimp. So I thought I'd let people know the latest. Halliburton is going to be making most of the money off this. And then my final point is that why is CNN and ABC and Fox and Yahoo and every other major media outfit saying give your money to the American Red Cross. When the American Red Cross, we have a huge article we put together on this, has been caught not just only spending 10% of the money they raise in, in, in every major disaster, but also stealing money, uh, actually stealing mail of victims in the past. Why are they the group that's being promoted when there's so many good charities that are out there? That's my last point. Okay, uh, it's a very good point, too. Uh, one of the people on the, on the Rockwell site uh, says that you would be a lot better off giving the money through the Salvation Army, and uh, that's probably true. Uh, Alex, I'm so glad to hear from you, and I'm glad to hear that you're not in the hospital, but uh, any time in the future when uh, I can do this, when I can actually uh, string a whole sentence together, I will be glad to do it. I don't have to string a sentence together for my friend Doug, because he'll always support me. Uh, well, you're doing a great job. Uh, God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll be back uh, right after this break. You know, some Republican is going to come to Bush's aid maybe in 2006 when Bush is leading the re-election campaign for Congress. And he's going to say, well, the one thing I really love about George Bush is he'll never desert his friends. <laughs> and it reminds me of Harry Truman, because that's what they said about Truman, uh, because Truman would never, never uh, desert one of the people in his cabinet or anywhere else, no matter how much corruption was discovered. And people said, well, there's a guy that's stood by his friends, and they still say it in the, in the history books. When Warren Harding, after the you know, Teapot Dome, Teapot Dome scandal, which was much, much more, uh, much was less egregious, uh, Harding called these people into his office and said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but you're fired. I can't have that you anywhere near me. And got rid of them. Uh, anything you want to uh, comment on what Alex said before we go back to the phones? I thought they were excellent comments. Uh... <laughs> 
on this part, and uh, well, well delivered. Uh, it's funny too, but <laughs> it's, all quite, it's all quite funny. I mean, there's really nothing we can do about it. So we, it's best to, we can laugh. Right? Right? Be amused by it. Right. Okay. Well, let's go to James in Oregon. And uh, good evening, James. Good to hear from you. Oh, hi. Yes, hi. Um, uh, we didn't catch you asleep, at least. No. Um, there's that uh, static before you when you connect. Uh, um, never mind. Um, I'm, I'm calling to first congratulate you on, on, on a great show. I'm, uh, I can't believe Alex Jones actually called in. I've been a big fan of his since he did Waking Life, you know, the movie. Oh, uh, no, I don't know that. Oh, he's in that. Yeah, it's a great movie, by the way. Um, but is, it, is it a dramatic movie or a documentary? Oh, it's hard to classify, actually. It's, it's, a, it's an animated piece that somebody did, um, and Alex Jones is a very small part of it, but he gives a very moving speech oh. uh, in that movie. If you, can, if you can get your hands on it, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up on the Internet. So, wait, wait, what did you say, Waking Life? Yeah, it's called Waking Life, and it's a, a philosophical um, piece. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, what's on your mind tonight? Um, uh, uh, this, uh, Mr. Casey is a wonderful guest. Um, I really like the way he thinks. Uh, anyway, I'm calling to say that if you go to dictionary.reference.com and, and type in the word fascism, you get the following response if I'd like to read to you. Uh, it's a, a system of government marked by centralization of authority, stringent socioeconomic controls, suppression of the opposition through terror and censorship, and typically a policy of belligerent nationalism. And when you read that and look at what's going on in America today, it's hard not to see a direct correlation, mm -hmm. especially when, when you're talking terror and censorship. Right. Uh, right. And, and lots of civil liberties, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, in my opinion, we're not, we're, we're if not beginning uh, fascism uh, uh, in this country, we're, we're halfway uh, towards uh, a fascist state, Sure. which, which is not good news. Um, and, and there's always one thing that's not included in that list, and the last item should be an excuse and an excuse for every one of the above items. Right. Right. And uh, excuse is a good word because uh, they're barely rationalization. Yes. Um, anyway, the, the second thing I wanted to comment on was something Doug Casey said. He, he, he kind of blames the American public for, for not being uh, fully aware of what's going on. And I, and I can't help but be reminded of a, um, a quote in The Matrix, uh, which in my opinion is the best movie ever made. But, oh, it's a great movie. Uh, um, I agree. Where he explains what The Matrix is. Um, and I've taken the time. It's very short. Can I play you what I'm talking about? Uh, well, we only have about a minute and a half for the break. Uh, can you summarize it in the best way you can? Basically, um, he's saying uh, that the people are not the problem, they're a victim of the system. But if you want... Uh, are you still there? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, great movie if you want to see it. Uh, that quote, I couldn't help but think about it. Uh, we want to save the people, but they're so inerred or inerred in the system that they would fight to protect it. And that's exactly the situation we have today. Oh, well, that is a good way of summing up what uh, Doug is saying. Uh, not, not completely, Doug. <laughs> oh, that's very, very good. I, I, I totally agree with that. I was going to say one other thing about fascism, though. It's that... Actually, it's an economic system as much as anything else. The difference between fascism and socialism is that in socialism, the state owns the means of production. But in fascism, the means of production are, are these are Marx's uh, basis of this. Uh, in fascism, these things are privately owned, but they are controlled by the state. Owned by the guy sitting next to you at the gold conference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, yes, very definitely. Uh, originally, this whole fascism was an economic system, and the Italians adopted it, and Hitler got it from the Italians, and then it became associated with everything else that uh, Hitler was doing, and that's where we get the modern definition. Well, look, we still have one more um, uh, segment to go, and we got one more esteemed guest to have, uh, and I hope you'll stay tuned then for the rest of the show, because I think you're going to like it. And uh, right now, though, I want to go to Virginia and talk to my good friend Jim Babka, who is a host of a very, very good uh, political talk show on Sunday afternoons at 4 p.m., Eastern Time on this network. Jim, good to have you stay up this late. Well, it's good to be up this late. I've been listening, and I've come to a conclusion after hearing Alex on air here that uh, when polling Genesis Communications radio hosts, you are a very popular radio host, Harry. You're the one we all listen to. Well, thank you. Well, I, I don't have the listenership of some, but I'm just glad to be here. Just proud to be here, as we used to say in Texas. Oh, wait a second, I've never been in Texas. You know, I was, uh, thinking, I, I was calling regarding your tsunami comment. I noticed that you put a slightly different twist on it, and I have yet another twist to offer you, and it's something I intend to talk about on my show tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern, and, and that is that what happened here happened in the United States, and the difference here is that we have reporters that are able to move around and talk about what's happening, and they've got the American people's attention right now, and so they're able to see this. They weren't able to see what happened in Thailand. They got maybe some, some pictures or some photos back, but we didn't have a whole lot of reporters there covering it for days and weeks and months. I mean, eventually they got tired of the story and they moved on with their lives. Sure. We have no way of knowing whether or not the federal government or anybody did a good job of helping those tsunami victims. We only have the word of the various charities and the federal government that was involved in sending money over there. We don't know how things are going in Iraq because most reporters are behind a wall inside a hotel. Unless they go out inside a convoy as an embedded reporter, they only see what our government wants them to see. And again, we have to take the word of George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and so forth, what's actually going on in Iraq. And oh, I yeah. think what's, what is really should be driven home here 
is that what's happening in New Orleans right now is exactly what's been happening in Iraq and exactly what's been happening in Thailand because we've been relying on the Santa Claus government to solve our problems. This is how government works, and you're getting a chance to see it now live on television on your own soil. Oh, Jim, I have got to interrupt you. Uh, you're absolutely right about everything you say, and it extends all the way inside of uh, government. But the, the quote of the week is from the, a nurse here at the hotel who I meant to quote at the beginning of the show, and I've got to get this in uh, before the break. Uh, and that is that policy, she says policy is a way of not having to think. Government is a way of not having to think. Just say government will do it, and I don't have to think about it. And she's so right. Her name is Kathleen Casey. is her uh, nickname, Casey Brazil. And uh, that is so true. Government is a way of not having to think. And, of course, all politics is government. All policy is government. And uh, federal policy is a way of prolonging uh, government tenure, uh, government anything. Uh, Jim, thanks, thanks so much for calling in. And, Doug, I'm sorry I didn't give you a chance for the last word. So you just have to come back another time. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Harry. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Doug. And uh, please tune in again next week. This is Harry Brown. Good night.